1949, in a hotel room in Dayton, Ohio, Bill was drawing the blueprints for a revolutionary mode of airline travel. It redefined speed, comfort, and availability of air travel. He convinced his company's board to take a $16 million risk on the design, which was a quarter of the company's entire net worth, even though he had no guarantee of a buyer. He was called crazy and idealistic. He was investing in a pivot of the industry no one believed would come, and the pressure was on as he knew an expenditure of this kind could make or break the company. So who is Bill, and what did he design? We'll revisit Bill's story in a bit, and while his tale is one of trend-setting and trend-breaking, so too is today's guest. As all this growth was taking place around us, and then frankly, as the sexiness of the sector was growing, it would have been really easy to try to do what other people were doing. As a matter of fact, we would occasionally hear from, let's call it experts or journalists, that our company at the time, known as Regis, may have been yesterday's co-working business center type of phenomenon. That's Wayne Berger the CEO of IWG North America and Latin America. IWG, short for International Workforce Group, boasts thousands of co-working spaces internationally. And on this episode of the podcast, he explains how IWG blew past those big names in co-working spaces to build a business that can last. What did IWG do differently? What were the gaps in the market IWG spotted that others ignored? And how was data put to use to help IWG identify what no one else could see? All that and more on today's episode with Wayne Berger. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Strategy at Mission.org, and this is Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to the highest levels of success and unpack how they actually got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run, what's so special about the people, the culture, and the processes that make it all happen. If you don't know IWG, that's okay. You're not alone. But you might be familiar with one of the 25 brands that live within the IWG network. Maybe you've heard of Spaces or even worked in a Regis co-working facility. They all live in the IWG bubble, which includes more than 3,500 locations around the world, a network that has been built over three decades. We started the business back 30 years ago, because our founder, Mark Dixon, saw a need. He was an entrepreneur growing multiple businesses and recognized he didn't really have a place to be able to establish his business and saw that in many other entrepreneurs and thought, how do we leverage economies of scale? How do we leverage operating costs? How do we start building our businesses without the challenges or restrictions that are posed amongst conventional long-term leases, which have been in place for hundreds of years, if you think about it, and came up with the concept. And that concept back then was incredibly novel. And for 25 years was very much, I would say, like an outlier sector. In an age of work from anywhere, it's hard to remember a time before co-working options. But back then, most employees had traditional nine-to-five jobs and most companies had offices that folks flooded in and out of every day. Even going back five or 10 years, the idea of co-working spaces was only just beginning to gain steam. Wayne himself was a new convert to the concept when he joined IWG in 2014. Co-working has really become on trend, if not sexy, over the last six years. I've been with the organization for seven years, and I can recall when I first started going through the process of 
of having a chance to work with IWG, one of my questions was when I first learned about the model, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And then why didn't I think of that? And then I was frankly completely shocked that this company had 25 years prior to me joining the organization. And when I first started, I think within the first couple of years, every time I would speak to a business colleague, an associate, a journalist, family, friends, I always had to explain what we did. Coworking was a novel concept. And what had happened from about 2015 on is it became very mainstream. It became actually almost more aspirational and quite sexy. But then something shifted and the modern digitally native worker began to demand something different from their workplace. And forward thinking companies started to buy into the idea that flexibility in the workplace might actually be beneficial, not just to employees, but to the business as a whole, which now no longer needed to tie up funds in long-term leases and the overhead of a traditional office. This realization was a game changer. And to say that co-working market exploded would be an understatement. From 2018 to 2021, the number of co-working spaces increased by 30%. New market players were cropping up and opening co-working facilities in the most popular cities around the world. And therein lies the problem, Wayne says. When co-working started to drive its run, you think about cities like New York and London and San Francisco, the highest absorption rates from 15 to 20 were within the co-working sector across real estate. Many organizations entered this business and many listeners will know some of those names. It's a challenging business to be able to grow in and monetize without economies of scale. But while we saw this incredible wave of new entries, what we did was we stayed on our course. So at that time, we were 3000 locations around the globe thousand cities, hundred countries, but we recognized how people were working was changing fundamentally. And as we saw competitors continue to grow in, let's call it the downtown financial districts, we continued our network growth within those same areas, but we actually then started pivoting to more of the suburban areas, the tertiary markets, let's call it villages, towns, really great pocket neighborhoods in major cities. Like you think about all the neighborhoods in New York and San Francisco and Toronto and Miami, et cetera. We started to ensure that we understood that what people and what companies were looking for was a network. They were looking to be able to work in a ubiquitous way. And people started to make this shift and companies started to make this shift towards a less workplace-centric environment. And people wanted the opportunity to have more flexibility. So starting to grow within suburbs, neighborhoods, tertiary markets, towns, villages, et cetera, really became a critical focal point for us to connect workers and companies around the globe with workspace, design rich, et cetera. And and actually became a differentiator and frankly became a key driver throughout the pandemic. From IWG's perspective, all those companies just starting to build a presence were already playing from behind. Wayne knew that and was forced to practice patience and discipline in order to not fall prey to the trendy companies that were making a splash. While all those competitors were zigging right, IWG zagged to the left. That's really interesting because everybody was going downtown, find the commercial space, let's make it sexy, let's make it available. Why weren't others going there to these tertiary markets, these villages, towns? Well, it's pretty simple. Every other competitor started building their network basically around that time. And where does everybody start building their network? They start in the biggest cities. If you think about back then, all the trends around migration were towards urbanization right? Companies were moving downtown because they wanted to attract the latest and greatest talent, right? Organizations, millennials, urbanites were moving towards this downtown core. So the natural thought process for companies starting their co-working business was 
well, we're going to start. We need to start in the major markets. We start in New York. We start in San Francisco. We start in Texas, uh, Dallas, Houston, et cetera, Chicago, London, Hong Kong. You look around the world, many organizations started their growth trajectory within those downtown cores. And not only that, but the thought process was the bigger, the better. Right, so large co-working facilities, 50,000 square feet, 100,000 square feet and beyond. So many of our competitors started growing their network in those downtown cores. They were also able to attract enterprise accounts, a number of workers, et cetera. And then obviously a lot of time spent on design and, and build up. But the reality is many of those leases were signed at the longest commercial bull run in history in a downtown core, which drives the highest lease rates, the highest OPEX rates. So your, your capital cost structure is so demanding, right? On a new business, we absolutely could have made a big mistake by just jumping on the phenomenons that we saw going on from other companies and doubling down on certain markets or certain types of locations, but we didn't do that. At this point, IWG had already established itself in city centers across the world. Rather than try to build those city-based properties up more and go head-to-head -head with competitors, IWG focused on developing new suburban markets, but tapping into a new customer base is never easy. There were a number of challenges in growing some of these suburban markets because there are markets that we entered that, frankly, co-working and flexible workspace was it wasn't just that employees and people didn't know IWG. They just didn't understand the concept of co-working flexible workspace. So part of that is actually turning a town or a city onto the concept that you can work in a flex environment close to home. And it makes a lot of sense. And there are times where we've made investments in these types of locations, depending on where they're based in North Dakota, for example, there's a runway period. Because you're educating people, not just on regions or spaces, you're educating a workforce on the concept of flex working. So that takes a tremendous amount of marketing. It takes community integration. It takes time because it's more of a slow burn. Reaching these new communities wasn't just a shot in the dark that IWG took. IWG was reading the tea leaves of data to get ahead of the competition. We were fortunate to have 25 and now 30 years of demand data and customer data that frankly we utilize to help us understand where do people want to go next? And that was really powerful for us. And it was a big differentiator because also we have a brand diversified strategy. We're the only player in the industry that actually manages and operates more than one brand. And that's a critical element because Brand also is inclusive of size. If you look at our suburban locations, on average, they're 20,000 square feet. They're a perfect size that people have an opportunity to access depending on what's going on during their day. The data was pointing IWG toward markets that others were ignoring, but the data was also telling Wayne and IWG a story about the industry and the expectations of workers today and what they wanted no one else was really tuned into. What was the data saying and how is IWG capitalizing on the trends no one else is seeing? Stay tuned to find out. With decades of data at its fingertips, IWG was in a position to truly understand the heart of what workers needed, but also what they wanted. There was no guesswork or flash in the pan ideas. Wayne and his team have always been built on cold, hard data and facts. So that's what they used to stay three steps ahead of the supposed up and comers who have since come and gone. We have roughly seven to 10 million people who utilize our space on a daily basis. Right? Workers that use our space, whether it's their full-time dedicated office, right through to dropping in like they used to at a Starbucks or a cafe. Because 
What's really interesting is the concept of workspace. This is going to change dramatically over the next five years. But workspace is becoming more ubiquitous, where people are going to start using space in a more fluid fashion, similar to how they're utilizing, for example, Airbnb or other platforms. This whole shift is starting to really move. So we utilize data, our user data, to understand how often they select certain brands. And then also, what type of space are they utilizing within the actual workspace, within the actual co-working facility? Do people like to use the club space more often than they're using meeting rooms? How often are they using phone booths? How often are they accessing or working with the concierges, the, our community managers and associates within the centers who help them can maneuver throughout the day? And then also, how often are they using locations? at the specific level. And then we can take that data and understand density. It helps us also ensure that we're on top of design because design is changing constantly. And it's not just changing in terms of the traditional co-working flex space environment, but it's also about changing where we geographically position the next center. IWG had learned to lean into the data to identify which business trends to pass on and which to pursue. We see time and time again that the companies that succeed are the ones that are data-driven. And this actually reminds me of another great example from the aviation industry. Executives at Southwest Airlines are using customer data to better understand what new services will be most popular and profitable. How do they do this? One example that stands out as incredibly innovative for the industry is the use of speech analytics tools. These tools allow customer service reps to understand the nuances of every recorded customer interaction, including from phone calls and from online interactions like social media. This data is used in real time to help guide the rep toward the best solution for a specific customer. Changes like these have resulted in impressive growth in customer loyalty for Southwest and helped launch it above its competitors in understanding what passengers actually want. IWG is also using their data to understand what trends matter. One example in how they are doing this successfully is in how they are pairing data with design. We've recently launched our first spaces retail concept in Napa which does a couple of things. One, it's the first co-working facility in the city of Napa, which is traditionally wine country, heavy tourism, but frankly, it's got a significant business community. And also many people who are traveling need to stop somewhere to work every single day or maybe for a couple hours a day. So we launched Napa during the height of the pandemic, a new retail concept, something that incorporates more ambient track lighting, lots of greenery, lots of club space, but some quiet space, facilitates a really nice environment in a space that physically doesn't normally have a lot of natural light. If you think about traditional retail, that was launched in the middle of the pandemic. It's been a roaring success, partly for the two reasons. One, again, expanding our markets to a new market versus just dropping another location in San Francisco or Palo Alto or Sacramento. And then two, this new design has been appealing to workers. So we've taken that design. We're, we're getting ready to launch our second spaces retail in Bogota, Colombia, in a new mall, one of the most affluential malls in the city of Bogota. We're on the third floor spaces. H&M's on the second floor. Amazing for workers because what does it do? Creates a community environment in a shopping mall tons of ample free parking, and they're surrounded by the services that workers want. Restaurants, cafes, all the personal amenity services that they're looking for. And they're usually located in geographically positioned areas of a city or a neighborhood. So we're launching Bogota, and now we're getting ready to launch Baton Rouge as well. That space's retail concept was built using data, understanding where demand was coming in, and what the user experience was continuing to look like because there are residential users and there are transient users and more and more people are moving towards mobility. So that's one way that we use data. Wayne also says that all the data is pointing in another exciting direction 
that IWG is investing in, digital and virtual experiences, setting a new trend that their competitors have yet to see coming. Our business primarily certainly is supporting the largest physical network of, of office space and flexible workspace, but digital is playing a critical role. So we've been making significant investments in our digital services, because what we're recognizing is the future worker, they're a hybrid worker. They're gonna work from home part of the time. They're gonna go to a corporate headquarters part of the time. And then they're gonna need to work from somewhere else part of the time. And by the way, their commute could look like work time as well, because as soon as we start incorporating 5G technology, the ability to transfer data within seconds, it's a game changer for everybody. So what we've been doing is we've been building out new businesses and new services that help support the digital environment for workers, and then also help ensure that the home-based worker has all the tools they need, the furnishings they need, the ergonomics they need, the social platforms they need, and then also the education and learning and services they need. So now it's less about just traveling to an IWG location, it's making sure that they're completely comfortable and productive at home, that they have secure broadband, they have all the tools and they have people they can engage with virtually. And then as they travel to work, whatever that office looks like, they have all the tools they need. And then when they get to a flex space, they have everything they need. So now it's more about the overarching solution versus just providing a great experience at, at a co-working facility. Wayne and the team at IWG are meticulous and careful about what trends they take risks on and which they let pass them by. A virtue that brings me back to our story about Bill. Bill's risk on his new airplane design could have left his company in financial ruin. But luckily for Boeing, the design Bill had put to paper in his hotel room was America's first jet transport, a little plane we know today as the Boeing 707. Bill is Bill Allen, and he was the former president of Boeing. He had no aviation experience prior to becoming president, and at the time of his design, Boeing only had a name in the military aviation market. When all his competitors had been focused on riding the last wave of military contracts from the war, he saw the commercial airline industry was ripe for innovation. Trend setting is hard but I'd argue that trend breaking is even harder. To watch every competitor make the same decision while you stand out as the black sheep requires a commitment to long-term planning and a radical understanding in the future of an industry. Bill Allen from Boeing was one of those radicals and Wayne Berger and IWG are committed every single day to not being led astray by fads in business and instead keeping an ear to the ground for the decisions that may not make sense to critics today, but will pay dividends tomorrow. You've been listening to Business X Factors, created by Mission.org and brought to you by Highland. If you like this show, please be sure you subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app. We'd also be so grateful if you rated and reviewed us on Apple Podcasts as this helps ensure that more listeners like you find the show. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors.